breaking news. Canon reveals a new 19 megapixel full frame global shutter. I'll tell you what that means for you. Two photographers, civilians are visiting the moon. We dig into the health of the camera industry and we uncover a Kickstarter scam already stealing tens of thousands of dollars from photographers. But first, we wanna thank Squarespace who makes all of this possible. Squarespace creates websites for you. You can choose your own custom domain, build a website for your business, take appointments from clients, sell prints, show off your stills, your video, or whatever you wanna share with the world in the most beautiful, simplest way possible. I myself use Squarespace for, I think, like five websites. Get started today at squarespace.com slash Tony. Totally free trial, no credit card required. You can just try it out and see if you like it. And if you do, the coupon code Tony will give you 10% off. Thanks for sponsoring us, Squarespace. Our top story, we're investigating what could be a scam. And to find the truth, we couldn't hire just anybody. We had to find the best, but there's a problem. There's only one man on the planet who can do this job, and he's retired. He's seen, he's seen too much. But we flew our chopper out to the woods in the mountains where he was chopping wood, and we made him come and uncover this scammer. His name, Tony Northrup. That's right, I went deep undercover to check out this Kickstarter project that I found advertising a full color night vision camera. It seemed a little too good to be true, but I have 25 years of night photography experience. At a glance, I can look at images and tell whether they were actually taken at night or whether it was actually just a daytime photo. And it's actually not that straightforward. A well-exposed night shot will look indistinguishable from a daytime shot, especially if there is bright moonlight. That will look just like sunlight, just with a longer exposure. And if there was some miracle camera that could capture beautiful daylight-like images in the middle of the night, you really would take a trained eye to be able to distinguish that. But as I looked at this Kickstarter, hoping that it would be real, there were a few clues that made me think it might not be so genuine. Some of the written specs seemed a little unusual, like it advertises a 2000W pixel starlight night vision sensor. And I don't think that means 2000 watts. I hope not. That would be dangerous, but I myself am unfamiliar with this unit of measurement, and I think they might've just picked a big futuristic sounding number. But for the exact same camera, they also advertised a 4000W HD imaging 4K HD resolution. This is not making a lot of sense. Is it HD, is it 4K, is it 2000 W's or 4000 W's? And what is a W? Here's something only the best of the best would notice. The viewfinder itself is just a black piece of plastic that has camera written on it. How is this man using that viewfinder? <laughs> okay, there's a lot of clues that this might not be a legit Kickstarter, but we can dig deeper. They show side-by-side -side comparisons between their camera, supposedly, and shots taken with an iPhone 13 Pro. I brought these into Final Cut and raised the exposure so I could peek into the shadows a little bit. Now, as a camera viewer, I've done a lot of side-by-side -side shots, and I know a few things will differ in these shots, even if you're using the exact same camera and lens. First, there's always gonna be a little bit of perspective shift because the cameras won't occupy the same space and time. Second, things like lens and sensor dust are specific to an individual copy of a camera and won't be repeated on each of these side-by-side -side shots. So let's look deep in the shadows to see if this is for real. Enhance. If we raise the exposure of this iPhone shot, we can see it has the same sensor dust. There's no differences in angle of view or background blur or camera movement. This is a single video clip edited to be dark and then labeled as iPhone 13 Pro. Let's also take a look at their example night photos to see if they were actually photographed at night. This is supposedly a night shot, but the street light's not on and none of the buildings have lights on. It's a day shot. If this were a night shot, we'd see some stars in the sky. Also, the buildings on the shore would have some lights on. There's no dash lights or headlights on this bus. The camera claims to have an infrared transmitter and this is an infrared shot, but it's not taken with an infrared transmitter because if it were, it would look more like a flashlight. This is taken with an infrared camera during daylight. You might be saying it wasn't worth getting a helicopter to pull Tony Northup out of retirement so that he could tell us this was a scam. It is extremely obvious, except here's the thing, it's not. 
These cameras are selling on Kickstarter for $193 each. And as of this recording, they have raised over $31,000 for this fake video in a plastic shell of a camera that's not even consistent within a single page. And one of the major photography blogs that I subscribe to advertised this to their viewers without any sense of irony, just as here's an opportunity to get involved in a great Kickstarter. What a load of crap. How do we allow this to happen in our community? How does Kickstarter allow this to happen? Now, there are a lot of legit projects on Kickstarter, but my feeling is those just add legitimacy to the scams. Kickstarter needs to block this crap. They need to stop it. That is $31,000 stolen and continuing to happen. That money needs to go back to the people. So what should we do about this scam Kickstarter project? Well, I've got two words. Shutter down. And in other news, SpaceX is sending eight civilians, including two professional photographers, to the moon. At least they say they are. This could be another scam, too. Look, Elon Musk is the head of SpaceX, and we're at a point in history when we are starting to realize that Elon Musk is not especially skilled and often dishonest or at least hypocritical. So it makes me question everything that SpaceX does. But the fact is, SpaceX is a group of people who are not Elon Musk. Elon Musk is not the rocket engineer. He is an investor and maybe he's a good marketer. But there are really good people at SpaceX and they're doing a lot of really good things. And I do believe in SpaceX as a company. With that said, I think there are some caveats about this project. First, when I read the headlines, I thought they were landing on the moon, but they are going near the moon. They are doing a circle around the moon and then coming back to Earth. Still a really, really big deal. I would be so excited to do this, but I would not get on this particular trip. No chance. I, I'm convinced I will go in space before I die. But not in 2023 when this is supposed to launch. Here's the schedule, but as a former Tesla owner, I know Elon's schedules frequently get pushed back, and this one has already been pushed back. The fact is the Starship that they were going to use was supposed to do its first launch in May of 2022, and then early December of 2022, and now that's been pushed back into 2023. So the ship these people are supposed to take has not ever done its first suborbital run, and they're not going to do the first run with eight civilians on it, right? In fact, if, if it were me, I'd want them to have maybe 10 runs under their belt before they start packing it full of civilians. But I do think this will eventually happen. And certainly in the next couple of years, space tourism is becoming a thing. Blue Origin has already put people into the upper parts of the atmosphere, including actually William Shatner. And why not put them a little bit further out? Is it incredibly decadent and wasteful? Yes. Is it burning massive amounts of carbon to do this? Yes, it's silly. It is an extravagant and expensive form of tourism. But sometimes things like this add scale and funding to projects that can be useful in other ways. I just have to hope for the best. I also want to say hi to all the flat earthers out there getting enraged. I believe the moon is real. I believe ships go into space. Prepare yourself for a barrage of comments. Now for an update on the health of the camera industry. SEPA has released their monthly sales numbers for DSLR and mirrorless cameras, and I think it's good news. First, let's take a look at the number of DSLR and mirrorless cameras, basically all interchangeable lens cameras since 2007. Now, you can see from 2007 to 2012, the increase in the number of cameras sold was crazy. This was such an exciting time to be part of this industry because every company was just throwing lots and lots of money in it. We were seeing these like massive improvements year over year. Image quality was like literally doubling every year. And then things leveled off. And then our iPhones got really good and people started to realize, oh, they didn't need anything more than their smartphone for the way they were using social media and images. And all those consumer cameras started to really fall off. And now we're down to about like 20% of what camera sales were back in 2012. But what I consider to be really good news is the industry seems to have leveled off for about three years now. Now my 2022 numbers are projected here, but it only shows about a 5% loss from 2021. This is particularly meaningful to me because this is 
how I pay the mortgage, right? Like if everybody stops buying cameras and stops studying photography, then I have to go run backups or <laughs> something I'd rather not be doing. Now, looking at it month over month, we can see in September and October, the sales are better than they were last year, but a lot of this is driven by new cameras being released as well as ebbs and flows of the pandemic and who can travel and who can have weddings and such. And that's why we saw that huge spike back in 2020 when people started to go back to the regular life. But like I said, overall things seem to be doing well. And I think the state of the camera industry now is probably going to be pretty consistent without any massive ups or downs for at least the next five years or so. Some specific numbers from NikonRumors.com. Year over year, DSLR sales are down by 18%, whereas mirrorless camera sales are up by 27%. Mirrorless cameras make up about 68% of the units and 85% of the value. So some people are still buying DSLR cameras, but they're lower end, less expensive cameras. The general trend in buying lenses is shifting from smaller sensors to bigger sensors. This could be partly due to the fact that all the new mirrorless camera launches in 2020, 2021 were pretty much full frame cameras and all the lenses at the time for these mirrorless systems were full frame lenses. Since then, Canon and Nikon have launched APS-C mirrorless cameras and some lenses, but it's the less enthusiastic people who are buying the lower end cameras. And thus, most of the lens sales are for full frame. And I expect this trend to kind of continue. I do think this is important because it's the formats that get the most sales that are also going to receive the most future development. And I think metrics like these let me know as I'm making camera recommendations to steer people more towards full frame when available, not because of any technical superiority, but just because if more people are buying them, then we're going to see more full frame lenses in the future. And that is better for buyers. Now, our top story of the night is Canon's global shutter. A global shutter is a sensor that can read out the entire sensor in one split second at one moment. To understand the usefulness of global shutters, let's simulate a whip pan. With the global shutter, we can pull a frame from the middle of the whip pan and the buildings are perfectly vertical. With a conventional shutter, the buildings have moved between the time it starts reading at the top to the time it reaches the bottom, meaning the buildings are now tilted. Right now, all sensors are read out basically from the top of the image to the bottom of the image. And the fastest sensors like the Nikon Z9 or the Sony A1 will do so in about 1 to 50th of a second. That's also a typical speed for a mechanical shutter. That's why the Nikon Z9 was able to get rid of that mechanical shutter because they achieved roughly equal speed. Most cameras have much slower readout speeds and that leads to rolling shutter, which is the leaning of images that are moving or while you're panning the camera and you'll see flickering under most modern lights that actually flash on and off so fast I can't see them but they can flash on and off in the time that it takes the camera to read out the sensor and thus you'll see banding in the images it's really common for people uh, shooting indoor sports because they're using a fast shutter speed that would freeze that light and they're often lit by less expensive lights that do flicker on and off the global shutter fixes all of these things. No more flickering lights, zero rolling shutter. And right now, the rolling shutter that we get on the high-end cameras and the mechanical shutters is enough for most sports stills photographers. So there's not huge demand for it there. There's more demand in high-end video. Now, RED has an expensive sensor like this, but I think you can spend like $30,000. So these can be really expensive and it's no wonder that Canon wants to make one of these. It is 16 by 9, so it is indeed optimized for video and it's full frame, 19 megapixels. It reads out at up to 58 frames per second, which is a weird number that they couldn't get to 60 frames per second with 12 bits of dynamic range. And I'm guessing the price is in the ballpark of $30,000. The bad news is it's not right now meant for uh, video or still imaging. It is intended for industrial, scientific, security, but this is a step in the right direction. Canon is making progress in making higher resolution global shutter sensors. And it's only a matter of time before they're able to make a three by two sensor that they can put in the future R1 camera. That will be the ultimate sports video wildlife camera. Now, I don't actually think the first generation R1 will have this. I would say the second or third generation R1 will probably have a true proper 
global shutter. It's just cool to see us making progress in that direction. In the comments down below, let me know what you think of these stories. And don't forget to check out our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace.com slash Tony will set you up with a free trial for a website. But if you decide to sign up, you can use the coupon code Tony to get 10% off. And that will allow you to get your custom domain. I'm NorthropPhotography.com. And that way people can email me there instead of Gmail. And that already <laughs> makes me look more professional, right? It also makes me seem more professional because I have a proper website instead of just social media. You know, my social media has just the most recent stuff I've done, but not the best examples of my work. You can't organize Instagram by commercial, wedding, portrait. You can with a Squarespace website. You can also set up a store to take prints, take appointments from clients, or just about anything else you can imagine doing on the web. And it all works great, whether people are using a computer or a tablet or a smartphone, and you might take that for granted, but I was a web developer for years. And once you start trying to build your own custom website and you get into that, you really appreciate that Squarespace just does it for you. They have brilliant designers who are working hard and they're maintaining your website. And that's why you pay a little bit per month, but it is totally, totally worth it. Anyway, squarespace.com slash Tony. Check it out. When you love it, the coupon code Tony will get you 10% off. Don't forget to subscribe. We have reviews of the Canon R6 Mark II coming up, the Fujifilm X-H2S, and some stuff I can't even tell you about yet. Bye.